and that'll Hey everybody, good afternoon. How are we doing today? You excited to be here? We're certainly glad to have you here. Hello and welcome to Samsung 837. My name is Chris Langlois. And I'm Ivy Cho. We are very proud to be on the Samsung team and here with you on day three of 837 Next, which has been our exciting event of series of live panels, discussions, performances, and more. Day three already. It's kind of yep. hard to believe. And whether you're actually here in person at our flagship a Samsung Experience store right here in New York City, or even if you're joining us virtually on our brand new Discord server, or even the metaverse, we're just proud to be bringing together a community of NFT artists, creators, emerging tech innovators, all during this fourth annual NFT NYC week. So as most of us know, but if not, Samsung has always been a company that pushes boundaries and defies barriers all while providing super unique experiences for our consumers around the world. So for example, earlier today, we learned about our launch in Decentraland and how we were the very first consumer tech brand to enter the metaverse. So as we take these steps into Web3, we are so excited for today's discussions, all about celebrating creators and building communities. Now, over the next hour coming up, you're going to hear an introduction on the basics of Web3, essentially. And that will be followed by an overview uh, by some of the leaders in the emerging technology space. So this is going to be from companies like Zengo, uh, Authentify Art, and Metaplex are all coming up. Okay, so to kick things off, without further ado, I'll hand it over to Keith Soljasic. He is the head of innovation at Publicis Media. Come on up, Keith. <laughs> Hey, thanks guys. Hey, 37, how you doing? It's great to be back out here again. And I'm so excited about this session here because at NFT NYC, it's all about learning and education and connecting and building communities. And there's a whole lot of people here that I've been talking to throughout the course of the week that said, I just recently learned about NFTs. I just recently learned about the blockchain. I'm, I'm here to learn about the space. And that's incredibly exciting because the more people we sort of bring in, the more we educate, and the more the people that start to understand and discover the Web3 space, the bigger this is gonna grow. And really their own voices are gonna contribute to the building of, uh, of this space. But let's take this moment right now to step back and support the community. And we're gonna get a little, I'm gonna give you a little bit of a background and education on Web3 where it came from, where it started, what it means, and ultimately where it goes as we bring on the panel to continue that discussion. So Web3 just comes after Web2, right? Easy, this is no big deal. That's easy enough. 
Well, the, in actuality, how we use the internet is undergoing a fundamental change. And if you go back to really the early days of the web, right, and we just called it the web or the World Wide Web, the information superhighway, this was all about making a connection online very, very, at the very beginning, right? And I could read something that someone else had published across the world, right? Maybe they were in the next town over, maybe they were around the world, but the internet first starts to connect us together. This was the early days of search. This was the early days of, you know, maybe I would shop online, maybe I wouldn't. But as we moved out of the web and into web two, okay, and this is where now not only could I read something that someone was contributing online, I could contribute back myself. And this was the era of the read and write internet. This is the emergence of the platforms that enabled that types of behavior the Facebooks of the world, the Amazons, the Twitters, they were connecting us all socially, connecting us all, our inf uh, connecting the information together, connecting what we knew with people around the world. This was now the explosion of the internet, and it came a very, very viable place. You could do business, you could create a community, you could learn, and the internet absolutely just exploded in web too. But that power and that capability and that enablement for the web, um, you know, was starting to become consolidated, right? And we, they're the platforms we visited every day and, and every week that enabled this type of behavior. But now we're on a, the precipice of the change. And I, I kind of mapped it out here, right? We're not quite there all the way into Web3 yet. We're moving into a brand new way of using of using the internet that enables these digital connections but truly enables digital ownership and i'll tell you a little bit about more on what that actually means and how it's enabled by the blockchain Oop. so the building blocks of web3 okay and they really are re this this is reimagining sort of, sort of the underpinnings of the technology from web2 so you can think about the blockchain and we use the blockchain as like the back end, right? This is, this is working behind the scenes to enable this digital experience. You've got cryptocurrency, and cryptocurrency has certainly exploded in popularity over the last year to two years in adoption, right? But this is the transactional currency of Web3. You've got a crypto wallet, or even just a digital wallet, and that is like your vault, right? It's your key, it holds your identity, but ultimately the consumer experience exists here with NFTs and the metaverse. And so the blockchain itself, right, this is a system in which the record of transactions is, is distributed, okay? So no one single identity actually controls that source of information. It's decentralized, it's repeated, it's really immutable because that distributed ledger of transactions cannot be changed, wiped, or erased. So the blockchain ensures that your digital items are recorded, transacted, traded, or otherwise, that record all exists on the blockchain. And those transactions are executed with smart contracts. So a lot like in the real world, you're going to buy a home, you execute a contract, you sign your name. Smart contracts are the digital equivalent of that. They set the rules of the transactions on the blockchain. So now we've got the back end, we've got the contract setting the rules in Web3 and when you build on top of that and you say, okay, I can use, utilize cryptocurrency to execute those transactions, right? I'm gonna buy something from here, I'm gonna trade something over here, and that becomes now again those asset, the assets you hold in that digital wallet. Now, what's really unique about this is they're secured by a private key, which means you own your assets. You own the money, the cryptocurrency, and you have full access and control over that because ultimately you own the key to those assets. Again, ownership, so key in Web3. Now that crypto wall we were talking about, right? Now, again, that's gonna hold my cryptocurrency. Yep, my ETH's in there, my Bitcoin's in there, maybe some little bit of Dogecoin, whatever you decide to hold. Uh, it also holds your NFTs or your virtual items or virtual property, right? And that crypto wallet provides the access to that NFT. So it's that intermediary point where you can utilize a wallet uh, for transactions. You 
also can use it to power your identity. You can sign in to site websites with your crypto wallet. It can grant you access. So this is a multifunctional, multi-use evolution of the wallet. Now, NFTs and tokens, right? And we've said these are the transactional currency of Web3. But not all tokens are created equal. And you've got something like a Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin are fungible tokens. I can trade with you one Bitcoin and you're going to give me back one Bitcoin or maybe the equivalent of ETH in cryptocurrency. And these are fungible items, right? They make sense. They're always tracking together. Now, non-fungible tokens, NFTs, that's, that's not an equal exchange, right? And using the Board Ape Yacht Club as an example, right? This Board Ape Yacht Club NFT is not necessarily equal to that one. Be, and for a few reasons, right? An NFT's value ultimately is going to be driven by a few things. What's the scarcity of that token? What's the rarity of that token? How exclusive is the ownership of that token, right? That drives value in this market. Is there cultural significance, right? Is this the first of its kind, provably, on the blockchain? Is there this was owned by a celebrity in the past, and now the blockchain ensures that record, now I own it, right? These are the, the things that drive ownership. But really, what's exciting about Web3 is the access and the utility that those NFTs provide, right? You can use your crypto wallet to access something. What does that mean, right? And these NFTs can take many shapes and forms, and that access and utility is still the underlying technology, but really brought to life in many different ways. So, of course, digital art. That was a great and really obvious use case for NFTs and smart contract technology in the blockchain. I could create a piece of digital art. I could sell it to you, but how do I prove that you didn't just download that from the internet, you didn't just steal that from someone else? Digital art had a problem, and that was proof of ownership. The blockchain and NFTs were the solution to that problem. I can sell you my piece of uh, digital art. You have a proof of record on the blockchain. $69 million later, you own a Beeple. Just that easy, right? No. Um, but that was really the catalyst for explosion that led to all these other use cases for NFTs. So you've got virtual land, right? You're actually own owning parcels of land in a virtual metaverse world. Maybe it's an NF a music NFT. Maybe you own an exclusive track from an artist you love, and you can now prove you are the owner of that on the blockchain, right? In-game items are an, an ex exploding use case uh, for NFTs. Now, this is a lot like you've got the Fortnites of the world and the Roblox and all these uh, gaming worlds that sit in the Web2 space. And yes, I own that in-game asset in your in your gaming metaverse world, but that is not transferable, that is not portable outside of that world. NFTs enable that portability in gaming ecosystems that I can own something here, I can utilize it here. Again, it's providing me that access and utility. Now, since we're talking about virtual worlds, right, avatars are the effectively your identity in the virtual world. So NFTs can provide that identity, they can provide the avatar, they can provide your actual skin the way you show up in these metaverse worlds. And you can own that as an NFT. And lastly, access passes. These are truly just tickets to a virtual event or a real world event. I was actually using an NFT last night to get into an event here at the party. All I had to do was show a QR code. That QR code knew I owned an NFT in my crypto wallet, and they were kind enough to let me right through the door because they scanned that token. So that's the example of utility driven by an access pass. So again, NFTs much more beyond digital art in the access and utility is a really powerful way that they, uh, that, that this, what this technology enables. So now you've got Web3, right? And it's, it's a bigger world than just NFTs and the blockchain. It's truly decentralized technology, and we've talked about NFTs and ENS domains as a way of owning your, your domain in Web3, and the blockchain enables the transactions, and smart, great. There's a whole lot behind the decentralized technology, but it doesn't just end there for Web3. 
And I want to go back in time a little bit to what really enabled the movement and what enabled the, what you're seeing here throughout New York today, which is NFT NYC. So there's two contributing factors here that launched the, what's effectively the cultural Web3 movement. One is blockchain applications. So again, you're, uh, you're creating these actual use cases that utilize the blockchain to verify transactions, meaning, hey, if you want to buy a shirt, you can use an NFT to acquire that. You want to acquire a cryptocurrency. These applications that allowed the, uh, that layer of the internet to be interoperable with the blockchain. Big moment there. Then you've got the 10K PFP collection. And Larva Labs was really the innovator here in creating the, really the first digital identity built on the blockchain with CryptoPunks. And you saw the rise of CryptoPunks and then ultimately the Board Ape Yacht Club that said, yes, I can, I can identify with that piece of digital art. I can make that my digital identity and I can prove my ownership on the blockchain. Where the Board Ape Yacht Club came in and really brought that next level of innovation is not that you just own that identity, but you have IP rights to that identity. You actually can create an entire uh, brand around your Web3 identity. And so these were those foundational innovation moments that led to the Web3 movement. And now you've got decentralized applications that really lean into both. Great example here. I want to show you. I think this just makes so much sense. Now, I own this NFT right here, this Atom Bomb Squad. This is from the hundreds a classic streetwear brand, they told their community and said, hey, if you own one of our NFTs, you have the access to get one of these really incredible free t-shirts from our collection, and you'll be the only ones that own this. So the way I went and acquired that t-shirt was I connected my crypto wallet to the internet. I signed the application, like signing in with your Google address connected to my wallet, searched back there, saw I own the Atom Bomb Squad, this is all happening in the background, by the way, passed me through to this commerce experience where now I can add that t-shirt to my cart, pick my size, customize it for free, and get it shipped off to my house all for free because I own that NFT. That's a decentralized application or a dApp. Still working. Okay, great. Now, um, some other really important things to consider, right? When you're thinking about Web 3 and the impact of moving from Web 2 to Web 3. And I think this is one that always comes up. And, and it's, it's really a little bit myth-busting. And it's a little bit of uncovering what's actually happening behind the scenes with NFTs and the blockchain and their impact uh, and their energy impact and really their impact on our environment, right? Now, Remember, we're very early days in Web3. The blockchain, as technology hasn't, hasn't even really been along that, around that long. And so their energy impact in these early days was really low, right? But as the use of the blockchain exploded over the course of the last year plus, that those transactions increased, right? We, we saw that, the blockchain. Now, all of a sudden, it, these, these initial, these early blockchains are utilizing a considerable, a considerable amount of energy to execute these transactions, right? And so we, everyone recognized right away, this is not going to be sustainable, both from a practice and an environmental standpoint. So the innovation comes along with what's called a layer two blockchain. This is a proof of stake blockchain. And without really going too deep and technical, those thousands of transactions that are going to be necessary when we move into this technology, thousands of transactions per second, can actually be executed with just a tiny fraction of the energy consumption of proof-of-work blockchain. So if one NFT is one pair of jeans, you know, the equivalent of creating one pair of jeans, one NFT on a proof-of-stake blockchain is like creating maybe just like that, that little piece of thread up at the top of your genes. So this is another evolution of the technology that's going to have a huge impact. But we all have to consider the energy impact on anything we create. And so we always suggest if you are looking into creating on the blockchain, you should understand your carbon footprint 
and you should always look to offset that carbon footprint. So our best practice is always work with companies like Ariel that can determine your entire carbon footprint and have an offset for that. Because, hey, we're all in this world together, right? We've all got to have a future here in this world together. So I'm going to wrap this up with this map of really how we see Web3, right? And yes, on the one side, you've got decentralized technology and all of the underpinnings of this technology, but it is married with decentralized culture, right? And that's what, again, is happening all over the city of New York this week. So you've heard earlier today, it's happening in Discord, where the community communicates in real time. It's happening on crypto Twitter, where you can build your network in Web3 and find your tribe. It's happening in the metaverse and increasingly in metaverse worlds, where those conversations in Discord and crypto Twitter move into, into virtually real environments, right? And th this technology is going to really mature over the course of the next three to five years. So as you look at this entire space and you understand the impact that Web3 can have, right? The use cases of blockchain technology, NFTs and the, use, the wide use cases that NFTs can apply to empower creators that are in this audience today to monetize their creations all the way through to decentralized culture and our new way of working and our new way of socializing coming out of the pandemic. This is the precipice of change and Web3 is really driving that. So I think what we're going to do next is we're going to bring up our panel and we're going to have uh, discussions from a, a few of these groups. So please welcome them. I'm welcome. No, no worries. Thanks, Keith. So up next, we are very excited to introduce. Uh, we have a company called Authentify Art, which uh, they use their technology to bring truth to art. So what exactly does that mean? They will be showing you firsthand how they're doing so through Samsung products specifically. So up to the stage, please welcome with me Theo Johns and Curtis McConnell. The authenticity of any work of art is arguably one of the most controversial debates of our time. Many artworks that have sold for millions, if not tens of millions of dollars, have later been proven to be misattributed or worse, outright fraudulent. It therefore stands to reason that new participation in the art market as an asset class is at a disadvantage because art lovers new to collecting don't know who or what to trust. Collecting art should be seen as a capital investment, not as an opulent acquisition. Our mission at Authentify Art is to solve this problem by providing accurate and verified data to the fine art collector and art professionals. We provide solutions for the entire collectible sector. In essence, our technology demystifies art collecting by leveling the playing field so that anyone can participate with peace of mind. Therefore, we're proud to be partnering with IBM to develop the ultimate tool to verify the authenticity of any work of art or collectible. Our two companies are collaborating to commercialize the Authentify Digital Fingerprint. It's like a biometric retinal scan for artworks, giving each piece a unique fingerprint which can be identified with statistical surety and registered on the blockchain. With this technology, anyone from art experts to potential investors will be able to determine the authenticity of any artwork from their mobile device using the Art Verifier. IBM and Authentify's partnership takes cutting-edge science developed and perfected over four decades by world-famous art diagnostician and scientist Professor Maurizio Serracini and makes it accessible to not only art professionals but anyone interested in authenticity across the globe. And with Samsung's industry-leading technology, the art verifier will become the standard accessory for every art collector and professional for all works of art from antiquities to modern and contemporary art. Hi, welcome. Thank you, everybody. Um, I know you'll be disappointed that wasn't me speaking. That's, uh, so I speak with an American slash Canadian accent. Uh, so I, I want to talk a little bit uh, about, uh, in the news, especially in the NFT world, people have talked about democracy and democratizing art. Uh, and for the most part, I, I've been frustrated by this. I think it's bunk. Uh, I don't think people really understand what it means to create a democracy. 
Um, and I spent a lot of time you know, working on Authentify to further a lot of things. And what we found out was to build a democracy takes really three key points. And these points run through everything that Authentify is trying to do. So number one is access. It's, it's not just good enough to provide access to people, it's actually in a pursuit of equality. And that means everybody could participate in the art market. That includes artists, it includes collectors, anybody, having that access. And traditionally, art is very opaque. The second part uh, is accountability. And, and sometimes our world seems to lack that notion of what accountability is. But really, in a pursuit of justice, you know, good operators should be rewarded and bad operators should you know, ostensibly go to jail. Uh, the art world is you know, notoriously full of fakes, and the estimates are about 40% of the art world is fakes. Then come along NFTs. And there's this great promise with NFTs that we will avoid all of the corruption and all of the problems, but if you don't put in the safeguards, suddenly, even as reported by OpenSea, we're at about 80% you know, issues with IP, with you know, fraud, with other elements. So the same problems that have confronted art forever now are NFTs, and they're doing it faster and better, but not in a good way. So the last thing, and when I first introduced this idea years ago, I said, you know, we were going to build a platform about truth. And I was told, well, that's controversial. And I took a double take, like, what do you mean? How is the truth controversial? I'm like, this is going to be the hill I die on. Uh, this is the thing that we actually should believe in, because democracies, if you don't have truth, if you don't have facts, you have nothing. So if you have an open market and anything that has a functional market has facts and truth, and that's what we're pursuing. So while we're not a marketplace, we're really building technology to bring all these things together. So when we talked about this, uh, I'm going to show you a couple things as we go through, and I'll try and go faster than my introduction. We're going to go from barcodes, which most, most of you know, to biometrics. And you heard in a lovely South African accent talk about that. So step one, we're going to talk about access. And I'm going to have uh, two of my friends show you a couple of things here. We, we started with this notion of like a VIN number for art. So every work of art, just like you can have a token for digital art, you can have in physical art. Everything should have one unique ID that we can tie everything together. And if you do that, one of the easiest ways was using a range of different RFID technologies. So with any painting, you know, one of the greatest problems when you go into a gallery or a museum is you're confronted with something that looks like this, a painting on the wall and a little white card that usually tells you the, the name of the artist, when they died, and the name of the painting, and that's it. And unless you've studied art, you feel kind of like an idiot. You decide if you like it or not, and you move on. Well, the only other option is, you know, my, my friend here, Theo, um, you just say a word. Sure, absolutely. So now we so have the ability. That's all I wanted from you. He's got a British oh, accent, right? <laughs> so, so typically guys like this, you know, they'll have an ascot on, they have a British accent, and they sound like they know what they're talking about. Theo actually does know what he's talking about. <laughs> but what I've tried to do is build a system to actually get rid of Theo and allow you, with just your phone, to go up and learn about it. So Theo's actually gonna show you without talking you know, exactly what we would do. So any work of art, if you're on Authentify, you literally go up to this, and what would you do, Theo? Now talk. So literally with your phone, you can take your phone and come up to the label, which is like any other normal gallery label. Uh, but with this, you come up to it and literally tap your phone, and it will take you straight through to a place where you don't have to listen to me. Uh, and it will give you all the information listed about the art itself, uh, take you through an experience with interactive videos, audio, everything to do with the work of art the work and the artist himself, every single piece of information that you could possibly know about that. So the, the QR was to confuse you, that we actually use RFID, so it's just like if you have uh, Samsung Pay, you've tapped your phone up to something, you pay for it, same technology can be used to give you access to all information so you know what the truth is, not the story I make up, or the other guy, you, know, you can trust Theo, but somebody who sounds like Theo that doesn't know what they're talking about. Yeah. So we'll keep moving here. Uh, this is just, we've done this for all sorts of collections, both private collections and public. You can imagine how much private art is out there if you could actually make that accessible to you. You could look at a work of art and see all of the works of art that are similar to that, same artist, same theme, anywhere in the world. Uh, and, and one of the things, is Peter around? Oh, so Peter here, um, as we go into it, one of the things I just wanted to say, just like uh, my, my friend Theo here showed how you can interact directly with this, Peter can actually tell you, I brought a work of art on the plane here, and Peter right there with that gun can actually tell you what's in that. He didn't know that, and he just by scanning that, he could actually do inventory on the entire room and know what's actually behind the paper or in a crate or anywhere else. And Theo 
if he you know, doesn't have a gun like that, he can bring his you know, phone over here and there should be a little label and he'll actually tap it. It's attached to the painting itself and it will actually bring up and verify whether that work of art is real or not. So it's not giving you an experience, it's actually giving you, it's verifying that it is in fact real. So that gives you an actual verification, a proof of life system, a tick here that says you are in the presence of the original. And you can piece. compare it to the image as well, which will be right below that, you'll see. Absolutely. So it shows the image. You can actually then locate it. And we have a record of every time anybody's interacted with any of those anywhere in the world. So I can literally map where it goes, who's seeing it, who's looking at it. And if I take the, uh, the same page and I try to refresh it again, it will then tell me that it is not verified. I'm not in the presence, therefore it's not correct. You can't even fake it out. So we'll keep moving. Uh, not only do we do it for individual works of art, but entire collections, all museums, and we've done it in a way that even if that work of art moves around, anybody that has this experience, that information, they have it forever anywhere. So it's kind of an amazing notion that we're building up this truth and it's a platform that it's you know, for the purpose of buying, it's a purpose for museums, collecting, and even better yet, the artists themselves get to tell their own stories. And we'll go to that a little bit later on. So I talk about due diligence, uh, those stories you'll hear later on. In the art world, due diligence is perhaps the funniest or scariest thing you've ever heard. People will ask what's true, they'll give you a little page and they'll ask for $100 million on it. And there's usually no verifiable proof. They may hand you a binder, that's it. We've built a system that allows every point of data going forward and also going back to be verified and validated. So you know, what you typically do for a house, you can now do for art. You may be shocked that that doesn't exist now. It's a weird world. So we'll keep going. Um, so the second part of building a democracy or democratizing a market is accountability. And this is another thing. Their opinions fly around everywhere. Everybody wants to say something. They make these grand, uh, grandiose statements. I'm the smartest guy on the earth, and I can tell you if it's a da Vinci or not, or that's a Caravaggio, or that's a Picasso. Well, but nobody is actually held accountable for making those claims. And rarely do we even go through peer review in that. So you can even imagine as it extends to the NFT world, people are making claims, they're making copies of images and they're posting it as if they are the artist, they are not the artist. So not only does it violate IP, but it also the buyer can be duped. They're, they think they're buying the real thing. The story is good, but it doesn't actually match up. So one of the little things you see at the top there, okay, I can't go forward. I'm a slow talker, but I need this, okay, there we go. Um, so the little thing you saw up there is what we call the art tracker. Anybody here have a Fitbit or an equivalent, uh, you know, a smart watch? Well, if you have one of those, you know what it means to track your vitals, you know, the temperature, blood pressure, et cetera. We took that same technology and applied it to art. And we have a little tiny thing called the art tracker that will give you temperature, humidity, vibration, uh, air quality, exposure to light, everything about it every two seconds. So now if you own a work of art or you're shipping a work of art, or you buy a share of a work of art, you can know everything about it everywhere it goes. You can even see when the cleaning person dusts the top of it when they're not supposed to, we see that micro vibration. If the subway goes underneath the building, we actually detect that as well. And it has a gyroscope, so you can tell when it's slightly askew, you could actually level it based on this as well. So, and we've set it up so that you can have alerts, not just based on these physical risk factors, but we can also have alerts on anything. How often is this being looked at? You know, are people actually editing things about this? You know, anything you'd ever want to know about it, you can, be, you can learn about that. So we'll keep moving. So the other thing, anybody know what Carfax is? You're an active audience, come on. Yeah, they're yeah. all nodding, yes. So Carfax was an innovator in the 80s who wanted to fix odometer fraud. Uh, anybody, any men here actually ever buy a diamond ring? Anybody know what the four C's are? Okay, doesn't exist for art. There is no standard to say, what do I have here, is it good? That's what this is. So we call it the eight A's, and there's only two that start with A, but our marketing <laughs> people said that's a good idea, so it's the eight A's. But these are qualitative and quantitative metrics, so any work of art, whether it be physical or digital, can actually have a score. It's authenticity, it's literature, it's provenance, everything about it. And once again, this becomes you're accountable for this, so you know what you're dealing. You can actually improve that score. You're building value. The last thing, this is for our audience right here, so finally I've made it to the NFT world. We envisioned, you know, it was actually seven years ago we wrote a paper about what NFTs, and they weren't NFTs at the time, they were just smart contracts, but what this could do for the art world. And we conceived this notion that we could build utility, and that was things like title. How could I verify title and ownership? 
Could I enforce things like encumbrances, loans against works of art? How could I deal if my siblings own this? How do I know I'm not buying it from the wrong person and everybody isn't being paid? Mm -hmm. We also ran into an issue where people were misrepresenting. They said, I'm selling this for my friend over here. They don't even know the person that owns it. So we can issue mandates. We can do a lot of things. We can even protect copyright. As the copyright gets owned by the artist, they retain that NFT, and it's derivative products that are out there that are all now connected. So we're really building an ecosystem using this utility of the NFT to protect all of the assets, the IP, from the artist to the collector. There we go. So last thing, I hope you're with me now, truth is a good thing. Uh, one of the things we did, we used to, I got into this industry doing actually authentication of art, and we used multi-spectral images, and you've probably seen these great articles like there's a Picasso underneath a Picasso, or there's you know, these things. Well, my original partner, Maurizio uh, Saracini, who was mentioned there, he invented most of that science starting in the 70s. So as we would go tr trying to authenticate that, what we found was there's stories behind the paint itself, how it changed, what was originally done, and so we built this viewer so you could see these amazing images and explore it. And then we started doing things so you could actually tell its story. And then we realized artists all want to tell their story when they're living. Some, they're, they're, you know, in the grave, they can't do it anymore. But there's a whole storytelling that adds value to it and interest and excitement. So at the very end, we'll show you that. The last thing, you saw a video, so I don't have to go into it. This digital fingerprint will be a game changer. The notion that you, in your hand, with a phone, can verify whether that's real or not at any point in time, it changes everything. You can go in, I have a phone, back away, let me check, I'm done, right? It's good, bad, or something's weird about this thing, and you can make a decision. So this is really putting power, once again, into everybody's hands. So I just briefly, uh, I love what NFTs have done to increase interest in art. Only about 3% of the world that could invest in art actually invests in art, and NFTs have suddenly opened up. It seems more accessible and exciting. What's super exciting to me, I've been dealing with a lot of artists, and one will come up on stage at the end here, People that are in their 60s and 70s and even 80s who are doing the most amazing innovation art, much more than 20s and 30s, you'd be shocked what you're seeing. And they're really bringing ideas. This one is, a, this is a, an artist, uh, Nazarov, who actually was brought a board ape and then in his own style recreated this thing. And this thing I think is about six to eight feet tall. It's huge and it's amazing. And when you're in the presence of this work, you will be blown away. But imagine a digital experience that tells a story accompanied by this, it, you know, it, it's, it's endless. We have another artist who, when you see this, it looked like a, a music video, so I'm, I'm in my 50s, so for those that grew up in that time in the 80s, the music video changed everything about how we you know, consumed music, how we experienced music, it made an emotional connection. Imagine art that you're used to just seeing and saying, I don't know, and it tells its story to music, to poetry, and it comes alive. So you now have this emotional connection to the art. Uh, this one, uh, Jerome Gastaldi, it, there's one we show, two minutes, you'll all be crying. And if you're not crying, you're not human. Uh, last, uh, and I think you, did we show the one at the beginning, D'Souza, or it'll come up at the very end? At the end. At the end. So um, another, uh, D'Souza, he's making amazing art. When you see it, you'll come up and ask me, how do I get in touch and how do I buy D'Souza's? So, uh, I think I'm gonna cue you up right now. Um, we'll talk a little bit about. So in the IT world, which I came from originally, uh, we talked about eating our own dog food. So we're gonna show you using our own tools how what I told you right there. And you're all gonna get, because Peter's gonna stand up right now, um, he's gonna hand out little cards that will have a QR code. Sorry, I didn't give you RFIDs this time. But when you go there, the same experience you're gonna see now is on your phone. And at the very end, I'm gonna show you a Da Vinci and behind the paint of a Da Vinci is something you've never seen before. And you'll only get to see it today because I'm going to you know, disappear it after today. But you'll see it right now. OK, you ready? Yeah, can we jump? Can we switch over to the, to the dongle? Ah, here we go. Perfect. OK, so here we have. <clears throat> so yeah, just out of context, uh, we built this viewer. So typically, if, you know, for those that are geeky, I'll explain. Uh, we would create images of works of art. So a typical work of art, let's say about this big, we would do 600 images in each spectra, so visible, IR, X-ray. We would stitch them all together, and that would create what they call a terapixel image. It would be massive, you know, something you know, anywhere from 20 gigabytes to 100 gigabytes each. And when we used to do this, there was no way to share this with anybody. It was, you know, it was beautiful, but nobody could see it. So we built a viewer that allows, and you can just show, we can zoom in on any area and show it, and he'll show you actually in the context of the painting. And then what we did is, well, why don't I actually tell you a little bit about what you're seeing here? So why don't you just click on some discoveries? And sure. so 
he'll just add in, and you can actually see points of interest on this. We'll show you around the painting, and then we'll show you them in a painting. And here, just like I talked about with any painting, this is the Adoration of the Magi. It's actually in the Uffizi Gallery. It's not in this gallery, and I don't think they allow kids that close to it. But <laughs> that being said, uh, it's a painting that is quintessential da Vinci, and I used to think it was the ugliest painting on earth, but I wouldn't tell anybody because you don't tell people in the art world that you don't like da Vinci. <laughs> but I'll show you why it's super exciting. So a couple things, why don't you fly, Theo? Just Do you want to jump to the? Just, just, no, just show them the couple things we have out sure. here. Okay. So, so, so here we have the object label, which you saw before, which can take you directly through to the experience, as opposed to what the existing labels do, which don't really give you much information. Uh, then we can jump across to the general public experiences, which leads you through from those labels. It gives you all the information that you require uh, on a sort of basic level. Um, interaction, if you want to go further, comes as you proceed. So this interactive art viewer allows you to sort of inspect the paint underneath the paint, behind the painting, uh, everything to do with the composition of how the work of art was made, which has ever been accessible to the public before. Uh, so that's something that we bring that's completely... You want to show them now? Yeah, let's, let's jump. Okay, we'll there. show them then. We'll, you know, you'll be so excited, I'll be able to show you the boring stuff at the end. So this clicks through. You can right from there click to the viewer. So as I say, this is a Da Vinci. It looks very brown. It looks very ugly. Um, it turns out Da Vinci didn't actually finish it, and he's cheating there. Um, and the, the monks weren't really happy with a lot of the iconography and the iconology. They had commissioned this work of art, so they covered up a lot of what he had originally drawn. And the beauty of this technology is we can literally look into it and see what was drawn that's behind the paint. So we can wipe away, this is 500 years of paint. So you can see here, if we look down, there's sort of a battle scene. You can kind of see horses, but it's hard to see what you're seeing. So it's like, let's just see what Da Vinci drew and understand what he was actually talking about. So if you would just want to you know, move it away, and you can see there's nothing up in the hills up there, except that maybe there is something up in the hills up there. Anybody know what that is? It's an elephant. And it's very clear when you look at it that da Vinci had never seen an elephant because he was amazing at, uh, at, at you know, all anatomy. And that looks a little bit like a mouse meets something else. But, but what's really interesting is he was telling a story in this work of art that nobody knew. He was actually telling the story of the Magi, the three kings as they came to see the baby Jesus. This is part of the journey. So it's actually telling this great story, but nobody really got it, so they just covered it up. And under this painting, you'll see all these amazing drawings, these interesting you know, elements. You want to show the, just a, a Mary's foot? I always love this one. So when I used to see it, people talked about his great you know, anatomy. If you look at her right foot, like, I don't know what he was thinking. Like, that's, that's an ugly foot. And you know, I don't have a fetish or anything. But it turns out when you wipe away this, you can see she's actually standing in water. And what he was doing was showing the refraction of that foot under the water. So, and we just show you this. This is a 500-year-old painting, and I'm telling you things that are new that you never knew about it. Imagine what you could do with any painting, including contemporary artists, things that they want to tell, their stories that they're telling, the journey, even the story of people who bought it, who've owned it, why they loved it. So this is what we bring to it, and when you think in the world, as most of you think of NFTs, think about the amazing stories and the derivative stories that everybody could collect. Only the Uffizi dwell in this, but imagine owning a part of history and the ability to explore it and share it. You know, imagine the value. Imagine how easy it would be to justify spending 99 cents to have that and take that home and share it with your friends to sponsor the museum that wants to collect and preserve these amazing artifacts. I think we'll just leave it there. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much to the both of you. Really appreciate you being here today. Is Thank anyone you. else blown away by that? Especially what mm. we just saw there. Uh, again, one more round of applause. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, here, this is not the original. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what really stuck out to me in the beginning there as well is just the fact that for traditional art, about 40% of what's out there is completely fake, right? So groundbreaking technology like this to try to reverse that number and try to really authenticate the art that's out there, whether traditional, digital NFTs, I mean, really, really impressive stuff. So how are we doing so far? Are we learning a lot? Are we having a, having a good time for this session? How, how are we doing? 
Everyone's good? All right. That's what we like to hear. So uh, coming up next, I actually, for the last five, ten minutes, was uh, picking the brain of our, our next guest. She has so much insight to give us uh, this evening. So coming up next is our good friend from uh, Metaplex. Please give a warm round of applause for Kaylin Dorn, who's going to give her perspective on the Web3 landscape. Kaylin? Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Hey, y'all. <laughs> Afternoon, Samsung Next. And uh, NFT NYC enthusiasts. Um, it's my honor and my privilege to be here in front of all of you right now and to talk about Web3 101 and this emerging technology showcase alongside the Authentify art team, who is so awesome, um, and Zengo, who we hope we'll see soon. <laughs> um, and thank you, Samsung Next, for believing in our work and the future of this space. Um, with the time that we have today, I want to introduce you all to a platform that in its first year made $3 billion for creators. And that's not Shopify, it's not Etsy, it's not YouTube, it's Metaplex. Oh, and that's me, and that's Metaplex. <laughs> but this is powering one of the fastest growing creator platforms in history. The Metaplex ecosystem has, since launching around this time last year, powered the world's largest NFT community with 95,000 builders and creators, powering 15 million NFTs on the Solana blockchain. Uh, all right, one more time. For impact, one year, $3 billion for creators through primary and secondary sales of 15 million NFTs moving through the Solana ecosystem, right? These are artists, okay, these are musicians, these are gamers, these are developers, these are builders, creators who have been historically disenfranchised. But with Metaplex tools are empowering themselves to have ownership of their work without traditional gatekeepers. The creators are the NFT ecosystem, right? Decentralized but connected in a shared ethos and we are so lucky to live in the midst of a culture shift in a way that we assign value to an asset and what an asset can even be. We're truly in a creator renaissance. Okay, but before I get too like poetic, let's, um, let's level set. This is Web3 101. We got to go to class, all right? So let's just take a pause, recognize the moment that we're in in a new creator economy. When you ask um, Gen Alpha, who are born after 2010, they are the children of millennials, they're not saying that they want to grow up to be a movie star or an astronaut they want to grow up to be content creators. Like, <laughs> that's facts. So what is this creator economy, right? It's defined as the class of businesses built around, uh, built by over 50 million independent content creators, curators, community builders, and that's including social media, influencers, bloggers, videographers, and the tools designed to help them with growth and monetization, right? So in this post, ish pandemic time, uh, people are more determined than ever to be in control of how and with who they spend their time, right? For context, there are 2 million full-time content creators and 46.7 million amateurs out there, right? So across every traditional channel, every niche community under the sun. More and more, these creators whether they're the beauty blogger, the Twitch streamer, the podcaster, they are looking to have control over their own IP and building a brand and a business around themselves and leaning into the trust that we have in an individual personality rather than in a faceless publisher, right? So you'll hear this breakdown in crypto often and you heard Keith say it earlier. We are, we are at the we're moving out of web two, and we're moving into web three. Web one, read, read only. This is your 90s internet. Web two, read, write. These are your Facebooks, your Amazons. And then web three, read, write, own. Here's a more intense slide. But, so web one is using, uh, is reading to the internet on static pages. Web two, users writing to the internet with dynamic pages and apps and Web3, 
is when users are actually able to take ownership of the internet. For many of us who work in Web3, we have a fundamental and philosophical belief that open source technology and, and greater degrees of decentralization will be important to society over time and that what we're building is censorship resistant technology, which by being on the blockchain can live on beyond us. Okay, um, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm getting poetic again, so I'm gonna go back to class. Do we need a quick vocab slide? <laughs> okay, so an NFT, it's a non-fungible token. This is Web 101, right? So NFT, non-fungible token. My favorite way to clarify between um, fungible and not, a dollar and a dollar are the same thing. They have the same value, fungible. Um, but a Honda Civic that's been sitting in a temperature-controlled garage for two years and a Honda Civic that has been driven through the rain and the sleet and an arduous commute for the last two years, same car, not, not the same thing, right? Non-fungible. PFP, profile picture, that's a uh, crypto Twitterism. I'm gonna say that probably a lot. Uh, and then GM, this is good morning. My mom actually slid into my DMs to ask me what that meant the other day, so. Uh, <laughs> so where is Metaplex in all of this, right? Metaplex is a protocol and a framework for building NFT applications, games, and experiences on the Solana blockchain. But we're gonna start at the beginning, which is this meteoric rise of Solana. Solana is the world's most performative blockchaining, meaning that developers can build on it with low fees, low latency, and composability, like a modern computer, but distributed. In May of last year, Solana developers saw that the industry's attention was turning to NFTs, but the architecture wasn't quite there yet. And it was mostly based on Ethereum NFT specs. But with Solana being faster and cheaper, the Metaplex NFT spec could be reimagined with features that creators actually need. And so they spun up Metaplex as the NFT standard on Solana. Since June of last year, every Solana NFT has been a Metaplex NFT. When, um, when I'm with my friends and explaining what I do, I, I tend to do this little hand gesture where I'm like, this is layer one of Solana, and this is layer, this is Metaplex. And then all of the code, the tools, the smart contracts, everything else, everything else, from like individual projects to storefronts, to launch pads, secondary sales platforms, is, uh, is it's this and this, and it slides easier. Okay, there, uh, I went back. Slides easier, there it is. Solana, Metaplex, everything else, right? It has been a wild ride to watch the rise of NFTs and this like cultural zeitgeist in the last year. Uh, like Spotify rap made a joke about NFTs. <laughs> but I promise you, we're still early because it's not just monkey pictures, it's community and it's culture. NFTs have onboarded more people to crypto than we could have ever imagined simply because they make us feel something. And whether that's one artist's piece, or a one of one, or a 10K generative drop, it, that gives you a sense of belonging. It's undeniable that we experience emotions with NFTs that, that DeFi was never going to do alone, right? People like having money, but they don't love their money, and people love their NFTs. <laughs> and it, it still blows my mind that even just a year ago, there were no Solana NFTs. And now we have this exploding ecosystem of two million creators that are holding an NFT. Two million collections, rather, that are holding an NFT that use the Metaplex standard. That's 15 million NFTs minted to date, and that's bear market or no, with an average of one million NFTs minted every 15 days? There's no slowing down. So who's Metaplex? This is our very first Twitter banner. <laughs> uh, Metaplex came out of the gate Elevating artists past the confines of traditional gatekeepers, that was what we first said, we're focusing on creators. But as the work grew, we realized that our focus on creators forced our developers to affectionately say, chew glass. Uh, in layman's term, they suffer for their art, yeah? Um, and we came up with solutions. By striving to be a people-first metaverse, we created a standard that the whole Solana ecosystem uses which is not a responsibility we take lightly. 
as we grow our standards, we are looking to go back to our roots by unlocking more opportunities and tools for non-developers. We are, we're punk rock, we're, we're scrappy, we're resilient, and we are driven because we truly believe that this technology is life-changing for artists and creators. The ecosystem Metaplex has built provides support, visibility, and respect for a path that is often disrespected and underappreciated. Creator empowerment is not a someday goal, but a present achievement. Or the starving artist is over if we want it to be. I like to think about something as straightforward as um, disrupting the gallery system, right? Uh, this could be any easily Web2 platform in a different context. So if you're, if you're a traditional artist and you've advanced your career so far as to have gallery representation, when you make a sale, you'll get the portion of the proceeds and so will the gallery. And if that piece ever trades hands again, it, which you hope it does because that means you're gaining notoriety, prestige, it's very rare you are ever going to see a portion of that secondary sale. Metaplex is built different in, a, in that a creator can choose their own allocation for, for royalties, for charitable percentages, and that's baked into our smart contracts. That means that while an artist is appreciated, they can appreciate, right? Earning every time that a piece changes hands as they should. All that to say, Metaplex is the world's largest NFT ecosystem and to date, over one billion in revenue has gone directly to creators. And three billion has been generated in primary and secondary sales from inside the Solana ecosystem. That is an undeniable culture shift. So, many of the Metaplex ecosystem killer IP projects, like, uh, like the gods, like Solana Monkey Business, like the Generative Ape Academy, to name a few, they challenge the notion that blue chips are exclusive to particular chains. The, our NFTs are not big cash grabs. They're, not, they're, not, they're, instead, they're independent creators who are gaining value and supporting each other, cranking out billions in value that goes back to artists. Artists who are able to quit their day jobs that they do not like and, and do what they love, empowered by Netflix. So with artists plugged into a global community. We're in the midst of a revolution, right before our eyes. This, this is a new creator era where NFTs have the potential to change the future of digital ownership and empowerment. Metaplex artists, they're moving beyond the PFP and they're building businesses. They're buying pro basketball teams. They're opening restaurants. They are becoming entrepreneurs with their IP and they're thinking of these projects as entire worlds, commercial IP. So what Web3 really means is that artists can chase their creative vision without compromise. And Metaplex proudly builds the creator layer of Web3. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Thank you so Thanks. much, Kaylin. Thanks, Ivy. That is so cool to see how I'm personally learning so much this week about how NFTs are truly changing the art world, and I think it's fantastic and so cool, and I can't wait to see Metaplex take off and keep growing. Um, so with that, up next, we have the co-founder and CEO of Zengo, which is the first keyless Bitcoin and crypto wallet, and he's gonna give you a little bit of an update on their software, so please join me in welcoming Oriel Ohan. I really want to show you something, a demo, and the slides don't really matter. Um, you know, every once and then there is an innovation in the space that really matters, and today we're going to change crypto wallets forever. Um, you probably heard about the stories of people losing their NFTs, um, getting stolen, making a mistake, clicking on the wrong link. Well, that stops today. Uh, we're going to present you something called ClearSign, which is uh, the first ever uh, firewall for Web3 Wallet that will protect you from making mistakes, even the one that you don't know yet. So 
what's the problem? People, people lose their NFTs, they sign transactions on Web3, right? What is a transaction? Uh, they're going to go to an app, they're going to connect their wallet, and they're going to do something with that application. Sometimes it's minor, sometimes it's a big deal, sometimes it's sending money, sometimes it's minting an NFT. That's how Web3 works. You connect your wallet to an app and you do something with it. What's the problem? The problem is that increasingly people are using their phones as primary screen. Crypto wallets have not adapted to that reality. And worse, they make the signing experience of, uh, of, of uh, interacting with DAP unreadable, unsecure, and unclear. So people are going to make mistakes. And that's becoming increasingly dangerous to interact with those applications. There are en an endless number of attacks and hacks and human error that can happen. Phishing scams, DAP impersonations, celebrities uh, that get their social account media take taken over, applications that get their, their website account taken over, rug pull projects, malicious NFT drops, etc., etc. And there are two major risks. The first one is the takeover of the private key, the famous private key, the 24 words. And the second one is an abusive permission that's going to be required in a wallet. And those two problems touch every single wallet in the market, whether they are mobile software, software, or hardware. And so those are live examples of uh, catastrophes that have happened, hundreds of millions of uh, NFTs and cryptos that have been um, lost forever uh, because of mistakes like that. All right, going very quickly. Sometimes it's also a platform bug like happened in OpenSea. Sometimes it's a protocol takeover because the security was not well protected. And at the end of the day, it's, at the end, it's in the end of the user that the mistakes uh, falls into, even when you have a hardware wallet. And people think they are protected, but they are not because on a, a tiny screen like that, you cannot really verify uh, uh, what, you, uh, what you're doing. People do not understand what they sign up for. That's the problem. It's impossible to understand what you're going to do when you're interacting with the web free apps. You think you understand, but you do not. And worse, you do not understand what you cannot understand or what you do not yet understand. And so that's a problem. That's how Web3 feels today. It feels like you're driving a car with no brakes, right? It feels that you are in a car without airbags. Who would drive a car like that? No one wants to do that. And no wallet has adapted to that reality. They make you sign transaction as if you were a perfectly, ex perfectly expert in, in security and in safety, and no one is, and no one can be because it's changing all the time. So uh, just to give you a glimpse on how things look today, these are famous wallets, and this is how they present transactions when you sign them. And people are just going to press the blue button or the green button, they think it's okay. If someone can understand what's on those screens, congratulations, you're an expert. If not, you're a normal human being. So this insanity has to stop, and it has to stop today. So can a wallet be, at the same time, highly usable and safe to transact. Can it be both? And it needs to be both because in Web3, you need to use a wallet. You cannot just have something stored in a cupboard and never use it ever again. And so that's what we're introducing today. Um, I'm Uriel, I'm the CEO of Zango. Zango is a crypto wallet. It's the first and only wallet on the market that allows you to onboard to crypto without ever worrying about private keys, about passwords, we're using multi-party computation and liveness biometrics. It's a lot of buzzwords. The reality, what it means is that it's super simple and super secure that you never lose your private key. And today we're introducing the first solution called ClearSign to protect not just your private keys, to protect also your transaction in Web3. So two protections that are critical to the life of a user with a crypto wallet. So what does ClearSign look like? It's um, it's an anti-phishing protection, right, against impersonation of dApps. It's verifying that the dApp is actually the dApp that you are using. It's protecting the seed from account takeover. No more you will have to worry that your, your, key, or your private key or your 24 words are going to be taken over because they do not exist on Zango. And finally, ClearSign will block transaction when there is a risk that is identified. So even if you really, really want to make a mistake, you will not be able to. So this is, a, um, I'm going to make a demo, so I'm, I'm going to go really fast on those slides, but this is how the experience looks like. We make this transaction extremely human readable, very simple, uh, children five years old could nearly understand it. There is a verification check mark 
and uh, the, then you can proceed in peace of mind. This is what, uh, what it looks like when we stop a transaction, when we block a transaction, we have identified that something wrong is happening. Even if you want to go forward, we do not let you do that. Clear sign is like a firewall, it blocks malicious transactions. And sometimes we don't know for sure that there is a danger, that there is a risk of phishing or that there is a risk of attack, but we see that the transaction is high risk, meaning that you're going to give a total approval to your wallet to be emptied by the DAP. You don't know that it's happening, but it is happening. It's happening more often than you, that you think, and if you don't believe me, check the history of your wallet, you will see. And so when we know something like that happens, we will give you a double trigger protection, a double trigger, sorry, alert and warning. We will let you know that you're about to give a critical approval. We'll make you confirm that this is happening so that you never, never do that again by mistake. And if you really want to do it, that's your problem. All right, I have a problem with the remote that does not, the remote is not working. Oh, now it's working. Now it's not working. Okay. <sighs> well, we don't make remotes, so that's, uh, <laughs> we make wallets, so I cannot be blamed for that. Uh, so uh, I want to make a demo. Do you want to see how it works? All right, I think it's better. Okay, so I have here um, production. We're going to switch to, uh, to the screen. Just give me a second to get things started. All right, so uh, I'm going to show you first how ClearSign and Zango enhances a transaction when you're about to sign in, a legitimate transaction. And then I will show you how it blocks and impersonating apps trying to steal your, uh, your NFTs. So here on that tablet, you don't see that tablet, but you have to believe me, I'm on a Discord channel, and I'm a uh, Discord channel of Pudgy Penguins. I'm going to verify that I own my, uh, my NFT, right? So how you do that, you go to a Discord channel, and uh, you connect to a bot, which is usually powered by Collabland, which is the first app that we officially support. Collabland is very, very popular uh, application in the Web3 community to authenticate that you own your NFT. So how does that work? So here normally you should see Zango. Let me show you Zango. All right. All right. So this is Zango. This is a cool, cool cute little wallet. It does a lot of things, but we're not going to go through that right now. And here in front of me, you don't see it, but you, 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 you will understand the principle. In front of me, I have the Discord channel of Pudgy Penguin, and I'm going to verify with Collabland, which is a bot, will ask me to connect my wallet and verify that it is me indeed, right? So now I'm landing into the Collabland uh, 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 website. And so what I have to do, um, if you own an NFT, you probably have done that in the past. As you will see, I will launch the QR code scanner of Zango, I think you see that, right? Yeah, you must see that. And I'm going to connect to Collabland. So until now, everything is fine, nothing to worry. Now I'm going to sign a message, and this is where usually the danger starts, right? So I'm signing the message. And what I have here, I have a very, very simple, very beautiful, very readable screen that presents the clear sign label that tells you that this message has been verified. If I click on it, I'll have a pop-up that confirms that and give me more explanation if I want to. And I can read the message that I'm signing with our JavaScript gibberish. Very, very simple, very parsed, very clear, okay? Clear sign. So that's how it looks. And then I can confirm it and move forward and go back to Discord and I'm authenticated. That's an example of how things uh, uh, are enhanced when you are uh, using uh, when you are using Collabland. I want to show you now how things look when using another app, and we're going to use token proof uh, as an example when an impersonating app is trying to make it look like it's the official app, but want to steal your NFT. Uh, so first, uh, I mean, you don't see it, but this is, uh, I'm on the token proof official app. Token proof has been very popular in NFT NYC because this is the app that many, many parties have uh, used to authenticate that you use uh, this NFT to get the, the ticket for the party, right? So uh, all the big events like um, the Ape Face and the Moonbird have, have used that application. So it's very, very important to authenticate to prove that you're on your NFT. So here I'm, I'm on their website. Uh, just to show you uh, quickly, like on Collabland, 
how it looks when you are signing the transaction officially. So this is the official token proof. And remember that screen. It looks like the official to this is the official token proof application. I'm going to sign the transaction. And I'm here presented the clear sign user experience that this is a verified token proof uh, experience. So I'm not going to do that. Now, what we're going to do? We're going to go to a fake token proof. Let's call it token spoof, right? And going to try to make me believe that this is exactly the same app. And you're going to see how it works. So here, I'm signing again the transaction. Now I'm on token spoof. Pay attention. It's showing me identically the same logo, the same URL. If any app will probably, not probably, will do that. They will show you the th same thing, even though this is not the right app. So I'm going to connect because I don't know. And then the app is going to tell me, all right, get your free ticket for the party, whatever. But the reality, that button is to steal, about to steal my NFTs. Boom. Zango has blocked an, un an unwanted action, right? So at that moment, even if I wanted to move forward, Zango clear sign is blocking you right away. Now let me show you what would have happened if that transaction was again actually going to even go even more in an insidious manner, trying to make me believe that first there is just a regular transaction to sign. As you can see, I'm about to sign a transaction here, but I don't have the clear sign protection. I can clearly see that clear sign is not here, and that message is unreadable. So here I have already some sort of warning that I should not move forward. That transaction is harmless. It's not stealing anything, but it already gives you some warning that you are in an unsafe territory. The other one was about stealing your NFT completely. The code will show that. So that's it for the demo. It's actually very, very tiny. It looks like a, a, a very little deal, but trust me, those who have lost millions of NFTs, millions of dollars of NFTs, understand exactly what we would mean right here. It's a big deal. It's a really, really big matter. I want to go back quickly to the, to the slide, please. And I have one minute left, so I have to go very quickly. All right, so clear sign is a safer UX. It's easy to understand. It recognizes the transaction. It creates alerts when, when, it, when you need to know them. And it protects you if you are about to sign a dangerous transaction that is about to take over your funds and your, uh, your, your crypto. Uh, what it's not, it's not an insurance and it's not a replacement for awareness. So it's very, very important to always be aware, but it's a very good assistant to you driving a car in the web-free road. The same way brakes and airbags protect you, doesn't prevent an accident, but it helps you seriously. Uh, so it's rolling out today on uh, Android and on iOS with Collabland as a launch partner and more apps will be supported very, very soon. We'll add them very quickly. That's it. Stay Zen. If you want to know more about Zango, you go to zango.com. You can enjoy that protection today. Thank you very much. Right on time. All right. Look at that. Literally, the timer just hit zero. <laughs> that was the most punctual you could have ever imagined. Thank you very much for that. So that brings us to the end of the presenters that we're going to have uh, during this session. Yeah, so now we'd actually like to take it over. We know we received some questions from our friends in our brand new US Discord server. So with that, we'd actually like to welcome back our entire group of wonderful panelists to the stage. Here they come. We saw a lot. It's going to take a while. Let's yeah. see. And just coming up now as well, you might notice a, a new face here. This is uh, James Nazarov, who he's an art consultant that actually works alongside Authentify Art. And he's also one of the, uh, he's the son of one of the artists featured in their presentation, Vladimir Nazarov. So uh, definitely some fantastic insight that he can provide as well. Yeah, absolutely. So to get started, I think we're going to hand over the mic to someone that actually in the audience who has our Discord question. So just give it a second here. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, there's Hi. our colleague Angela. There's so Angela. Uh, yeah, perfect. I understand we have some questions uh, for our panel today. Yes, we do. Um, I apologize if I mess up any of the usernames. I'm going to try <laughs> my best to pronounce they them correctly. Don't count. <laughs> um, okay. So our first question is from Jagadam. So how important is the founder's background and experience when looking at an NFT project? 
Anyone can, can answer. Uh, anyone can answer. Anyone can answer. Anyone can answer. <laughs> you know what? I'm gonna take this one. Uh, I think that's a really great question, and I think you should one do your own research, uh, but two, that's a really personal question. So I'm not. I'm gonna answer for myself. I think you should absolutely look into someone's background, but the ethos of Web3 means that like anyone can come here, that anyone can do this work, and with enough commitment and care and attention, anyone could be a founder of an NFT project. It's not limited to someone who comes from Silicon Valley. It's not limited to someone who's been a dev. The tools that we build are for everyone. So just believe in the person. Can I, can I take the cynical answer? Of course. Uh, I think you should be skeptical and you should look deeply into the background and what motivates, why are they doing what they're doing. Um, one of the things that we've talked about for a long time is literally putting friction into the system. You know, Web3 makes it so easy for people to participate, but we need to put an on-ramp that doesn't let just anybody come on without at least proving why they're there and who they are. Um, and I, I think it's really important when you're talking about collectibles, you're talking about art, it's not to limit artists, but actually allow them to stand up and be that person they can get back to. Um, so when there's so much, you know, people obscuring who they are, and the number one question in art is, James, you wanna say it? Well, I mean, it's, it's, it is all about that sort of integrity into art. As someone who spent the, about the last year collecting cartoon animal pictures, uh, it's, there's been a lot of projects where there have been rug pulls, there have been scams, and we just, we take a leap of faith. We find something that we like, we find a community we like, uh, uh, some piece of art that we're attracted to, and we go for it, but it doesn't always work out at the end. So, you know, we take that risk because we, we, we fall in love with something. And I do just want to say as well, before we get to our next question, that if you're in the live studio audience here in uh, New York City, we'll also have some time for you to ask questions as well after these Discord questions. Just want to make sure you, have, to go you, on you have your time as well. <laughs> Thanks. Great. Okay, so the next question is from Legato FP. Where do you see the Web3 space in the next five years? <laughs> oh, I'll, 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 I'll start with this one. But I will, from, from an art perspective, what I really loved about NFT technology was just that exploring the concept of what is actually tangible. So what is property? So we're talking about the metaverse, we're talking about land, we're talking about furniture, clothing, avatars. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it is tangible what we can feel, what we can hold, what we, you know, what we can taste and smell. I, I don't think it is anymore. So in conversations that you know, I've had with my father, we're exploring where we would take his physical art in a digital medium. We kind of look at it as it has this just unlimited evolution to grow. And we're just really excited about taking these pieces, taking these ideas and see where they can develop in this just playground of unlimited potential. I think there's three stages. Um, for those of us that lived through the dot-com bubble uh, and bust, and then what came out of it, if you don't remember, uh, there was no security, there was no trust as we led into 2000, 2001, but a lot of early adopters and a lot of excitement. And a lot of people lost a lot of money. But what happened is those of us that were in the industry and I was in the e-commerce space when it was just this fledgling space, but we solved real problems. We solved security problems. We solved trust problems. We dealt with this. So what I see is this next iteration, there's a lot of stuff that will disappear. A lot of the garbage will come out. It'll be out of the market. But you'll start seeing new technology come in. It'll start innovating. So in art terms, you see a lot of JPEGs. It's what existed. You'll start seeing in the next iteration artists taking advantage of advantage of technology from the entertainment world, from the gaming world, pushing what exists right now. And then stage three, you'll actually find artists innovating, creating their own technology. They will be pushing technology designed exactly for where the artists want to go. And I think that's the power of Web3, is you're going to have a lot more pure development and driving innovation. So I don't think it's going to come from Meta. I don't think it's going to come from big organizations. They'll provide infrastructure. I think it's really going to be this organic movement of really interesting tech innovation that will push and push and push. And you won't know what it is. And as we all remember, it was, you know, I think it was 2008 where social media really started to take hold that nobody had conceived that was even a thing. You know, it's not necessarily a good thing now, but it, you know, it wasn't even really conceived. But these are the things that come out of it because it's new and they're experimenting and pushing. And what I love about Web3 is it's the first technology that actually empowered creators and artists and gave them a voice on the internet. They have had really nothing. The fact that Instagram was the limit of what they really had, it was nothing. 
So this is a way for them to monetize, to contribute, to really provide something that's not a poor man's gig economy, but actually participants of people that are generally not represented in the art world. That's women, that's people of color. This is really an opportunity for the industry to change, and I think that will go beyond art to everything else. I want to add to that, and I think you're making incredible points, but that we are, we spend more and more time on the internet every day, and the generations that are coming up behind us also spend more and more time on the internet every day. I don't think we're going to see anything that's like, that's an NFT. And again, these are my personal opinions. We're not going to get this feeling of like, that's an NFT, that's it, it's different than my own reality. Your reality will start to merge with digital assets. Um, and what is redefined as an asset, right? We're gonna move into spaces where the shirt that I'm wearing is also the shirt in the metaverse. The NFT that I bought of sneakers is also going to, like, will be with me in Decentraland or somewhere, but I'll also get the shoes delivered to my home. And like, it, it will become ubiquitous at a certain point in time that we won't feel, like we don't think about typing on a QWERTY keyboard anymore, we just do it. We don't think about putting in an email address, we just do it. We're just going to, it's just going to become ubiquitously a part of our lives, this way this information lives and moves. And we shouldn't be scared of it. <laughs> Great. Uh, so this is the last question from the Discord audience um, before we open it up to the audience that's here. So think of your questions now. Um, so this is from NFT Friends. What was your light bulb moment when you realized how big NFTs could be? What was your light bulb moment when you realized how big NFTs could be? My light bulb moment. Uh, I think my light bulb moment was when I realized that it was uh, possible to sell my NFT on any platform that I wanted without having to ask permission. Like mm. I think the sense of power and control that it gives you, but not at the moment that you acquire the NFT, at the moment you want to let it go. Because mm. this is really the off-ramp is usually the difficult moment in anything. And so the possibility to have absolute control on that, even if whatever OpenSea says, no, you cannot sell it because they can do that. Uh, and you can sell it in any way you want, even directly peer to peer. That was the moment of like joy and the uh, moment of like panic was, <laughs> because there is also a moment of panic, yes. uh, was when uh, I realized how disastrous was the, exper the security experience of onboarding people to NFT and offboarding them from NFT. Mm -hmm. Like the, I, the, the simple idea of having to handle 24 words and keep them somewhere safe, and no one knows as a clue what it means, and everyone gives their own tip, but they never, never work. This is a terrifying recipe for disaster and the and end of world. And so, so that was for me something that say, all right, this has to, this can be extremely powerful, but it cannot be powerful in that way and that has to change. So going back to my presentation again, maybe, but I think those are two elements for me. Mine was when uh, my partner, Carrie, back there with the red hair, told me it was my aha moment. But what we saw in the art industry was something that you know, so few people participated and we had this massive audience of especially younger people and non-traditional art participants jumping at stuff that a lot of us kind of scoffed at. Like, what are you doing? But it got frothy and more people started taking an interest. And that pure step we talked about, the accessibility was the most exciting thing I'd ever seen was suddenly the audience wasn't the 3% or the 1% or the half of 1% that 97% that was largely ignored wanted in. And as soon as I saw that, like, that's our audience. That's who we're going after. That's, that's how this fundamentally changes the world. And if you think about it, the art world is a $3 trillion of assets, and that's 3% of the people participating. That becomes a massive asset class that's all about culture, and that connects people. And I think this generation is all about culture, connecting, and experiences. And this is one of the things that I think will be the most powerful changes in the world. It's exciting that there's changes in the art world, but it's also exciting that you can bring in someone who never thought they could participate in the art world. Yep. Um, and that, when you have platforms like Solana, where you have <laughs> this economic opportunity that you can buy in at a relatively low point, that means, like, I, I've had the privilege of going to hacker houses around the country and around the world 
where I meet an artist who like minted their first project, they're selling it for, for soul, and that alone will buy them uh, dinner for a couple nights, and they, they made something with their art, they made money. How many artists in the world ever make it even into a gallery? How many artists in the world ever make it to a museum? But this gives that everyday artist, that person who just needs to believe in themselves, the opportunity to build a future for themselves. And that's, that's my aha moment when I get to talk to those people and I see their lives changing. And the fact that they continue to be compensated for the work that they created yes. yeah. through royalties yes. as it goes on. You know, we have artists that they, they start emerging and their work is selling for $500, $2,000. And then in a few years, maybe it's a million dollars at auction. Yeah, or these that's wild my, prices. And, and my cocktail speech is always like, I mean, they appreciate while, like they are appreciated <laughs> while they appreciate. Like, yes. that's the first time you, that's a cultural yeah, renaissance, yeah. man. Okay, you can, you can have that one, but can I quote you on it? Yeah, girl, anytime. <laughs> no, but I, Minted, I think, so I guess you know, I'm back on it. Most, right. people, most people don't think about it that much, but the artist gets the lowest price of anybody when that art of, work of art is sold almost universally. Right. So they never participate, and it often forces them at late in their career to be cranking out works of art to try and make money off all the amazing stuff they've done before. And we fixed that largely in acting. We fixed it in music. You know, it's not 100% fixed, but there's good models that this technology suddenly empowers all of these people, all of these independents to participate in, in their own IP. And I think it's easy to talk about art right now because that's what we're seeing, but I do want to like, remind people that NFTs are not exclusive to art. There is so much more. That five minute, like the five years forward question, it's not just art. It's, digital identities, it's data, and data wants to be free. As an art guy, I don't disagree with that at all. I think you're 100% right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great, okay. Uh, well, thank you, that was very insightful. Um, I think we're actually, we wanna be selfish here and take it back to their physical, physical space, IRL, Samsung 837. Can we get some live questions from the audience? You can go ahead and raise your hand if you have any questions yep. you'd like to uh, ask our presenters today. We'll make sure to get a microphone over to you. At least one on the front here. What, what NFT utilities or technologies do you think are really gonna open up the average person's eyes to this, right? Because mm. I, I feel like right now, there's a lot of people obviously in this space, but like I'm talking about the masses, like what is gonna be that turning point? That's such a good question. I'm gonna think about that for well, one second, I'll let those to, guys go. To me, all of our emphasis was on problems that people have already. They know these problems and they haven't been able to solve it. So as I said, we started with title NFTs. So, you know, title is fairly standard in real estate, title everybody knows for a car, but for all these other, you know, non-fungible assets, it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of like, trust me and what do I do? Where do I look? So the notion that this can be done incredibly lightly and easily is step one. And that applies to any commerce anywhere. So if you start thinking about you know, developing countries you know, with you know, anywhere from commodities to unique assets, how do you establish that trust? And what Web3 says, you know, and they call it trustless, but it really means I don't have to know you to trust the transaction. I know the transaction is good. And that fundamentally changes how commerce can work. And you know, for anybody that was in the supply chain world years ago, I'll do a history lesson, but there was something called a Reba where people could all you know, talk to each other and figure out and order things and they didn't know who they're getting it from but there were standards people were following. And everything to do with Web3 says, let's set up some standards and now I can see wherever I want this, wherever, who I want to deal with. And that is, it's so powerful. Us in the, in the Western world see trust as being the core of all transactions. The rest of the world, you know, my friend always says like the Southern Hemisphere and much of Asia is based on truth. Uh, they want verifiable facts. So this is what Web3 literally empowers that kind of transaction for everybody around the world. You don't have to have 100 years of history to be able to participate in the current marketplace. That is mind blowing. Any other takers? You can mute me if you want. You're doing great. <laughs> okay. She does. Anybody else out there going once, going twice? Any uh, other questions from our 837 yeah. audience? Have, oh, we have a question from. Oh. Excuse me, but I have a question. So, what brands do you think would be. They already have. 
And for anyone that couldn't hear uh, who's watching virtually, the question was, uh, what companies or corporations do you imagine uh, perhaps leading this space moving forward? Samsung. Hey. Samsung. <laughs> That's a good answer. <laughs> So, but to your question, I think there are a lot of brands that are already there. A lot of um, uh, like high-end fashion is already there. Nike's buying up space. Like everyone's buying up space in different metaverses, making sure they have like different ETH and Soul addresses ready to go. This is it's not who it's who's gonna like. It's still early for lay people, but it's not early for brands. They are on their way. I think all brands eventually will be a part of it. So there will be there's NFTs for digital property. There will be NFT tags for physical mm -hmm. property. And uh, I think brands will have to be in the space to be relevant five years from now. Yeah. Anyone from the third level up here that might have a question? <laughs> Uh, yeah, anybody else here in our audience? Thank you again so much for the questions. Yeah. Question from so, well, I just, uh, on the way out, we forgot, there's a, a video I just wanted to have them share with you, which is uh, an artist that uh, has been collaborating actually with, with Nazarov and others. And, and I think it just gives you a glimpse of a really spectacular artist and what he's doing. And we just love how it displays on these you know, huge screens. Yeah, can we hear it for the Samsung screens? Yeah. Like, oh yeah. my god. Woo! I. Can, can I'm turn overwhelmed up the sound? by how good this can is. We get, can we get the sound on it? Because it has sound. I could try and do a voiceover, but I won't do it justice. <laughs> Come on, Samsung. No, you can't get the sound? We heard it earlier. All right. Here, there might not be sound for this, but the visual is, uh, is, is fantastic. Can you tell us a little bit more about what's, uh, what's going on here? So this is a, um, Ali D'Souza. He is basically a natively digital artist who's also a filmmaker. And he started translating a lot of his digital work into physical works of art. You know, he was printing on glass, he's painting, he's creating. And then he combined it with movie making and creating these you know, lovely, amazing spiritual pieces. And they're great compliments. So it'll be a physical work of art, and then they'll have this experience. And sometimes he'll combine multiple works of art featured in this. So it ties the whole story together. And they're beautiful, and they're fantastic. If you see his uh, physical works in person, you can't stop. You, like, people literally do a double take and walk back. You know, it, 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 like it follows your soul and pulls you in. And you know, as, as we see the different things he's doing, this is just one glimpse of how what I would consider getting into the fine art space, like really speaking these emotional connections and allowing an artist, and he's almost 70 and he looks 40, uh, but he's doing this amazing innovation. He created dome experiences, so you can go into a huge 50-foot dome, and it's like the metaverse, but you can experience with friends, you can see it in a way. It will make you, it will bring you to tears, it will make you think about your life in a different way. Um, so we have so many of these, it's so exciting to work with artists. You know, as I say, we're about the data, but it's so lovely to help them tell their story and share it in really amazing ways. And well, thank you for sharing more of this content for sure. Uh, if we have any more questions in the audience, again, we'll make sure that uh, we get those answered. Any other questions? Uh, last call here. All right, looks like we're good. So again, one more big round of applause for all of our <laughs> friends. Since we are on day three of 837 Next, don't forget the events we have coming up this week. Tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern, we'll be right back here for our Women Rise conversation, which will really emphasize the female creators making waves in the NFT world, something I think is super cool, very passionate about, can't wait. Um, that will also include some hands-on meet and greets with those creators in the afternoon. And you obviously can join, as always, through our new Discord server and 837X in Decentraland. And also something exciting we just want to talk about as we're wrapping up. One more thing uh, you can't miss. If you like what you're seeing here, you know, if you've had the chance, if you're in this space to you know, roam around, check out some of the fantastic products here at A37, if you're seeing them online, whether it's you know, mobile devices, appliances, you might want to also uh, check out Discover Samsung, which is happening right now on Samsung.com. This really is uh, our biggest quarterly savings event. And again, it's happening right now. Uh, all until Sunday, so we were talking earlier, the air dresser 
is hairdresser. the deal of the day. That's something I've Today. been eyeing uh, for the last year or so. If you guys so. want to go check it out, it's right over there in our connected loft. It's amazing. It's an at-home dry cleaner. Highly recommend. It's a huge deal on that today. So I'm, again, keeping my eye on that. But Samsung.com. You know, we want to thank all <laughs> of you for being here today, virtually and in person. We hope you really enjoyed this discussion. We'll see you back here uh, tomorrow for more events as we continue our NFT week here. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs>